you know, America was still a country where slavery predominated, yet and still through quote unquote chicken, uh, kitchen slaves, these children were born and their fathers knew that they fathered those children and they did not want to see their children continue in slavery. So they decided what we need to do is to pack them up, especially after Shea's rebellion, is to pack them up and send them away from the United States and let them go and help to found a new country. One of the leaders of that was who? Was Clay, who was then Speaker of the House of the United States at the time. And it was these people that facilitated these boats coming over here and first landing over there at Chevron. Okay? They were the ones that did it because it was their children that they wanted to get out of there because they didn't want them to continue to be trapped in slavery. Okay? I don't know if you heard the history of Alfred Russell. How he got here. Okay? His, his grandmother was the sister to Lincoln's wife. Okay? And they were living there in uh, Kentucky in the United States when her son fathered a child by one of these kitchen slaves. Okay? The child was Alpha Russell, who later became president of Liberia. Alpha Russell, then, upon the death of his father, his mother remarried. But she never granted him freedom from slavery prior to uh, her marriage. When she got married the second time around, due to the laws of coverture that existed in America at that time, he continued to be a slave and a slave in his mother's own yard because all of her property then went to her husband. They went to court. The records are there in the state of Kentucky. They went to court on this issue. And Abraham Lincoln was a lawyer for this lady. You know, a Todd, her name was, before she got married to this man. And the court ruled in favor of the new husband, of his sister-in-law. At which time, she said, all right, I'm prepared to give you everything in this world that I own, but let my, let my grandson go. Let my grandson go. Then finally he agreed for the grandson to go and he found his way that he ended up here in Liberia. And just amazingly enough, later on, he became a president too of Liberia. Okay? So, I'm only saying this to say that there was this division but the powers that existed in America at that time wanted to see their children the ones to come in the founding of this new nation and to be the ones that would rule. And so that obtained for a period of time here. That is a historical fact, you know. I heard someone, I was waiting yesterday to testify, I heard someone say that we have to change history, uh, redo history. You can't do redo history. History is history, you know. Once it's properly written, once it's properly recorded, history is, re is history. It is immutable. It is immutable, sir. You can't change it. But what we can do is to take that history and look at it and, and revisit it from time to time and from there try to glean out ideas that will help us for the future, for the present and the future. But history is history. Historical facts are just that. They are historical facts. 
you cannot take those historical facts and blot them out like how they tried to do in, in uh, Soviet Russia some years ago or China. No, you can't do that. So we have to accept responsibility for our acts. We have to accept responsibility. We do something wrong to our fellow man. It's our responsibility to get up and say we are sorry for that. But you know, I tell you a joke. It's not a joke, it's a reality. I have a friend, a black American, a good friend of mine. And he said to me, he said, you people in Africa today, you Africans, you decry us black Americans. He said, but why? He said, only because your ancestors will run faster than our ancestors. So, you know, our ancestors got caught and put on those ships and sent over there. Whereas your ancestors who could run so fast, they stayed on this side. Now, are you all going to blame us for that? Because we're taken and sold? That too, sir, was wrong. But it's all part of history. And we have to accept history for what it is today. Okay, um, how did the two party finance these activities, aside from the imposition of levies? How did the two-party do what, sir? Finance its activities, okay. apart from the imposition of levies on members and non-members of the Truth Party alike. Until 1972, the Truth Party assessed a half month's salary per year on everyone who was employed in government. And the assumption was that those employed in government were members of the Truth Party. Right or wrong? In ninth, what's that? For right, is that right assumption or wrong assumption? I think it was wrong. You asked me, I tell you it was wrong. Right. In 1972, immediately after President Thomas became president, he changed it. You know, he, he obliterated that in 1972. So from 1972 on, that no longer existed. Now, what happened to I understand also that uh, the Truth Party had shares in a number of business establishments. As a matter of fact, the Truth Party, the, uh, the impressions going through what you see as available evidence is that one gets the impression that concession agreements and all of that were influenced by, uh, by uh, <coughs> Truth Party interests. As for, for, for example, that's a wrong impression, so let me stop you right there. For That's example, the ownership of shares in Simenko by Truth Party and other business establishments. You know, the shares in Simenko, I know nothing about them, okay? I repeat, I was General Secretary of the Party from October 26, 1979 until the fateful day in April when the coup took place. That period of time, okay? So, when it comes to Semenko, I know nothing about it. When it comes to the other one, Liberia Timber and Plywood, I do know something about it. And when it comes to that, uh, what happened was this. Uh, what was the name of the company before that? Vampli. Vampli came to Liberia and negotiated a concession agreement to do plywood, mostly, in the Sino County area. Then they found out that they were losing and they were not going to regain their monies. But they had gotten an OPIC, O P I C, an OPIC. Uh, insurance on the investment. So within a stated period of time, if they were to declare the business uh, non-functional and the business where they had lost money or losing money, then they could recover on the insurance. But if that date transpired and they went beyond it, then they lost all of their, their monies. So when they found out the condition in which they were, they hastily went to government. And this was told to me by President Talbot himself. 
So they went to government and they told the president, they said, well, why, why don't we sign this over to you? All we want to do is to get rid of it, then we can go back to America and collect our money. And he told them, he said, no, I cannot have it that way. So they said, well, how should we do it? He said, well, all right, give 51% of it to the truth party and give 49% to the workers. So they said, all right, and that's how it was divided. 49% to the workers, 51% to the truth party. But I think there were dividends that were paid out maybe twice during this whole period. After that time, dividends were declared just prior to the coup, but they were never distributed. Okay? And there was this guy, a red-headed American, who used to be Diana in Sino, head of it, and they controlled all of the monies. So when the coup took place, he was able to fly out of Liberia. I think, I'm told, I wasn't here, that he had a runway made, had a plane coming from Cote d'Ivoire and take him out of Liberia. And then he went to America, canceled all of his telephones and what have you, and he controlled and, and absorbed all of those monies. But as faith would have it, maybe his name will come to me as I talk, as faith would have it, uh, all of those monies got lost by him. They decided to come back to Liberia, you know, the land of the, I don't know what, his rice farm, I guess, to come back here and look for more money. And he came back here and he started to work with the Taylor government. Okay, I don't know whether he worked with those government first, but he worked with the Taylor government. And during that time, he may have acquired some of it back working with the same timber situation. But what happened was that he got killed. One day he got shot and killed in, uh, in Sino County. Huff his name was, Huff, Huff. I think Bob Huff, his name was. Yeah, correct. Popularly called right here, that he says, correct. Yes. And so that's what happened there. Now, you served as a associate justice during a crucial period in our history, and at which time there was a landmark case, and I have reference to the family trial. Mm -hmm. Looking back, would you mm -hmm. consider would you say that he was dealt a fair hand in the administration of justice and in the determination of uh, whatever came before the court? Were there facts to substantiate or those decisions of the court were influenced by political considerations? I think, sir, with all respect, you are traveling outside the pale of these investigations. But I will answer you. I will answer you. I wrote the opinion of the court in that case, if you look at it. And you will see that subsection D of the penal law at the particular time used the phrase or otherwise, or otherwise. Now, how can you have someone charged with sedition and talking about or otherwise put the whole kitchen sink in it the law was wrong the law was wrong in my estimation but it was not my position to change a statute that was clear unambiguous and unequivocal it's not within my province to do that it is the legislature when you show them through the enforcement of a bad law that that law is bad, then it, is, it, is, it behooves them to go and revisit the law and make the requisite adjustments and modifications there too. And Fambula was incarcerated based upon that. I forget the year now. But immediately when Toba became president, that one of the first things he told me to do was to release uh, Fambula, Henry B. Fambula from prison, which I did. Okay, the records are there, we'll show it. 
And then he said to me, he says, I want to give him a job. I said, which job do you want to give him? He said, well, all right, let me, let me bring him into the mansion and make him legal counsel to the president. I said, fine. And he brought Fambula into the mansion and made him legal counsel to himself. Okay? Which position he held for a while. And thereafter, he came and said, you had to take Fambula and send him to Cape Mount as superintendent. And that's what he subsequently did. In the meantime, you will check the, the penal code as it currently exists, and you'll find that that subsection D has been removed. I had it removed. Now, you mentioned during your testimony that serving in government and also serving the Truth Party, you noticed that President Talbot had demonstrated a marked departure from the confines of the Entente Cordiale that you felt was signed between. Not signed, not signed, it was parole. It was parole. It was not signed, sir. In other words, it was verbal. All right. And, and seeing him move out of the ambit of what that Entente Cordiale was sort of uh, produced some fear in you, fear of uh, consequences as such. There have been many, many, many statements about responsibility for the coup and the subsequent developments. Recently, we listened to the testimony of a functionary, security functionary, saying that he stood near the executive mansion at the time the coup was unfolding. It is on record that you left Liberia days, should I say, if I'm correct, please, uh, if I'm wrong, please correct me, days or so before the coup. I left Liberia on Good Friday, on that Good Friday. The particular date, it was early April. The particular date, I don't recall. But uh, you can look at a calendar, but it was on Good Friday. The evening of Good Friday, I left here. Now, comparing, looking at what this testimony says, considering your testimony here, were there any, is it safe to assume that there was some knowledge, prior knowledge of the coup, or that you were informed that uh, a coup was going to take place, and that you subsequently left the country, and that Mr. Tower had moved so far out that his doom was just a matter of time, and that uh, you did not want to be near? No, sir, that's totally incorrect. And did you at any time uh, receive... Well, let me answer you, now. let me answer you. you, you you are making a provocative statement. Let me answer that statement, if you will, sir. <clears throat> the, the answer to that is this. Is that starting two years prior thereto, I determined that Liberia was a country that needed to go back to its roots when it comes to the production of our staple food, rice. Okay? So, therefore, I went to Cape Mount to the village of my grandmother in Cape Mount and had them to survey the whole area which constitutes 6,750 acres of land and I brought from America a firm called Akel International and commissioned them to go and uh, check the soil there for the planting of rice they were paid for doing that job, most of the money except for the last 50000 Then uh, they came and said the project was feasible. I got a group of banks together who were willing to fund the project for 7,000 acres of rice. The project cost us $25 million. I got a group of banks together willing to do so. And I wanted to leave Liberia 
on several occasions prior to that April to go and finalize the agreement with the banks and with Akel. But the president kept asking me to postpone my departure, postpone my departure. Until finally, he said, all right, you can go now. Since I set up most of those county uh, elections and they are taking place. So I left on that Good Friday and went on to America and went straight to Louisiana where we initialed the documents, okay, for the $25 million to come back here and grow rice in Grand Cape Mount. And that happened on Wednesday afternoon. Thursday, uh, Council Oliver Bright and I, he went along with me as my lawyer. We left and drove to New Orleans. And from New Orleans, he went to Bakersfield in California to talk with the Getty Oil people about his oil palm plantation. And I went to Boston to see my sister. And whilst in Boston that Friday night, the coup took place. That is the factual sequence of events that is documented and can be shown. And I just pray to God that at that time we have been able to develop 7,000 acres of rice in Grand Cape Man. We wouldn't be in the problems we have today. But I will have you know also, sir, that I've gone back there to Cape Mount and I've gotten 15,000 acres of land today as we sit here. And with God's help, we developed 15,000 acres of rice in Grand Cape Mount County. And then from there, we'll go to either Nimba or, or Grand Jetta and do development there too until Liberia becomes self-sufficient in rice. And that's what I'm working on right now. And when I've done that, then I can die. Now, as an official, uh, a high-ranking official of the Truth Party and, and uh, the ruling, uh, ruling party, what kind of access did you have to intelligence reports? What kind of what? What kind of access did you have to official intelligence reports? What kind of access? Yes. When I was Minister of Justice, I had access. But not when I was with the party, you know. Now, did you at any time during that period, prior, immediately prior to the 6th of April or so when you left, did you at any time receive any letter delivered to you by a female soldier warning you of an impending coup? No. Now, Did somebody say that? I, mean, I haven't been listening to that. I just want to find out. Did somebody say that such a letter was sent me? I'm just asking a question. Did no, you? but I'm asking you the source of it. I want to know. If somebody came here and lied on me, I want to know who it is. I'm not just going to permit you to lie on my good name and character and get away with it. No, sir. No, I didn't say somebody said that you... I'm asking, did you receive... No, you, were, you, you were so definitive in your question. Did a female soldier come to you, so and so, so... That must be something that somebody... You didn't say just that a soldier, did a female soldier. Well, okay. as you know, our, our, our process of inquisition is very robust, so we pick up every... try to pick up every, you know, bit of detail and try to match it in, in this uh, white puzzle. Now, as uh, General Secretary of the Truth Party in 1979, mm -hmm. Dr. Sawyer announced his uh, intention to contest the mayoralty of Monrovia mm -hmm. and said that he was doing so with the view to calling as a wake-up call to the Truth Party as a what, sir? As a wake-up call mm -hmm. to the Truth Party mm -hmm. to have a relook at the election laws and all of that on the books since elections were due in 1983 or thereabout and so that the Truth Party, the government itself could prepare itself sufficiently for the challenge when the time came that it would not find itself at a, at, at a loss when uh, challenges were being made for, for example to the property tax as a prerequisite for voting and all of that a point is that if you want to ask me a question, please ask me a precise question, and I'll answer it. Did this not constitute a wake-up call to the Truth Party 
in 79. How did the party react to this? Did it dismiss it as ramblings of power hungry uh, 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 individuals or as a genuine wake up call to do some soul searching and look at the laws and prepare for a democratic transition? <laughs> you know, sir, I will answer your question first and then I will make a further statement. Please. <clears throat> I was driving by City Hall, a fairly good memory, driving by City Hall when I heard that uh, Amos Sawyer had decided to run for the mayoral position of Monrovia. I said, ah, this is good. It gives a good challenge to whomsoever we put up. There were three or four people including a relative of mine, Councillor S.B. Stubberfield, who wanted to run on the party's ticket. I told him no, he couldn't run because he was fairly tainted. The press, the Mrs. Talbot's brother, one David, who was then mayor of Monrovia, he wanted to run. And I went to the president, I told him, I said no, we cannot support him to run. We have to go outside and get someone who hasn't been involved in politics, but who has popularity within the country and have that person to run and be our candidate. So after a while, I went to Francis Horton. He's still alive. Chuchu Horton, they call him. So he used to be a football player, he used to be goalkeeper for one of the teams here, etc. So I went to Choo Choo and I asked him, I said, you know, do you want to run? He said, well, I don't have the money. I said, forget about money. The money, the party will, will make it available. And he said, okay, he will run. I said, all right. I will make up to a million dollars available for you to defeat Emma Sawyer. I will make up to a million dollars available to you to defeat a Messiah. And I gave him the first consignment of that money to, to show you the seriousness of the challenge as far as I was concerned. I didn't take it lightly. But why were the, why were the elections postponed? The, the end of it, sir, I really don't know. Right now, as I sit here, I don't remember. And if that's an honest answer, I don't remember why it was postponed, but I know that we're prepping our candidate to face off with Dr. Sawyer. You heard me laugh a little while earlier. What, you know, no, 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 let, no, no, let me tell you why I laugh. Okay, I'll tell you. <clears throat> After many years, the same Emma Sawyer in uh, Banjou, I met him in Banjou, and there he was then, had become selected as the head of Ignu to come here. When he got here to Liberia, I followed him here a short while later on my first trip to Liberia in February of 1991. When I got here, uh, there was a question of somebody contesting the election against Amos Sawyer, the great Democrat. I met Chair Chippo, who had worked with me as an assistant minister when I was Minister of Justice. And he said to me, he said, oh, you know, he's a minister. I want to run. I want to run. But I don't know if they will let me run. I said, why not? I think you should run. And I will go and ask why you cannot run. But I will assure, I don't know if you were here, sir. But, I was. But what happened was that Sawyer went in unopposed. Nobody ran against him. And then he was selected again, or elected to, to, to stay the four-year term. 
the point I'm trying to make and drive home very forcibly is that when you are in one position, then you look at everybody else out there. When you get in the people's seat and look there, and then you are in the seat, then you look at it differently. He's still alive. Yes, but I, at that time, uh, if we look at the historical periods. What, sir? The historical periods. The one, I, I, is there some kind of period? I didn't get the word. Our historical periods, would you uh -huh. agree that the historical periods are mm -hmm. different? Mm -hmm. At that time, so the circumstances may have been different. What, what circumstances made it different for, for Sawyer to run without, without, without uh, opposition? What made it different? Please tell me. Put it in your proper historical context. Tell me. The presence of international peacekeeping troops, the partitioning of the country, and the suspension of the Constitution, the Supreme Court, and all of that as a result of these peace agreements. So clearly the circumstances as compared to 79 were different. Anyway, I'm not going to argue with you, sir, so I'll let you make your expressions. But I, I put the point whom I wanted to put on. So if I should ask my last question. I'm sure, go ahead. From all what you have said, mm -hmm. it will appear I seem to be of the opinion that you hold the Americans, the United States government, or its functionaries or its agents in complicity for all of the troubles Liberia has seen over the last years during the period of, uh, of our review. Am I correct in this assumption? I've made a recital of events, sir, that put in this proper uh, historical context can bring about the requisite conclusions. Thank you very much. You're welcome. <clears throat> testing, testing, one, two, three. We thank you very much, Mr. Witness, for the presentation you've made. I found it very uh, informative, especially for that early period of our history. Uh, we're very grateful for that, because not many people have been able to give us such informative information. Um, I have a couple of questions. Sorry, they're not that small. There are many, but we'll try to make them quick if we can. First one is, I'm concerned about the whole idea <clears throat> of a one-party system from the viewpoint of our motto, freedom, liberty, and justice for all. And the issue of the passing of the Declaration of Human Rights in the early 50s, as you told us. 40s, sir. 40s, rather. So it would seem then that, at that from that time onward, there should have been a drastic change in our policies towards a more open and transparent system of government as compared to a closed one-party system of government. So I was just concerned about, you know, whether you would like to shed light on this issue because we noticed, for example, from 19, I think it was around the early 50s, 40s to the 50s, the three-party-led government systematically eliminated its competition. Situations like Detour having to leave, situation like Coleman being killed, etc. And then from that time onward, they ruled supreme for over 16 years with no competition. So I don't know how that would have fared well for the creation of a more transparent type of system. And therefore, seeing the reality of what happened in the 70s and the 80s with the progressives and their sort of violent concern for change, it would almost seem that it was justifiable. So as one of the key leaders and heads of this party, even I noticed your original uh, platform was the Weeks represented We Hope in God. And you had also said that you are a man who put God first, nation next, and family last. Mm -hmm. So no, third, third, rather, third. sorry, third, yes. 
So as I as we put all this together, I don't know whether you, you want to share with us something on this issue. I don't want to be more specific, but to leave it more with you. It would just seem that there was a contradiction here. Sir, I think I answered you already. Mm -hmm. I answered you when I spoke of this Antan Cordial. Mm -hmm. Okay? Anti what? That word, please? The Antan Cordial. Uh-huh. What I spoke of earlier, okay. which your colleague had allusions to also. Mm -hmm. I answered that the situation in Liberia was such that in those days, we gave away our foreign policy decisions to the United States. And in compensation for that, she turned her Nelson's eye on whatever happened domestically in this country. And you never heard America or anyone else talk about violation of human rights. It no matter who they sent to Belayala, who they sent to BTC or what have you, you never heard anyone mention anything about it. You know, as long as we sang their song, they looked the other way. So then those who were in the party as the key supporters of Tugman's ideal were also, in a sense, puppet, pe puppet people. I mean, you didn't have any way of personally realizing that this was wrong and pushing for a difference? Or was it just that the fact that the ends justify the means? Or I'm trying to understand why there was no internal revolution, in a sense, to bring that change instead of allowing the process to reach the dead end and death that it did go to. You know, I really don't know the extent of Tubman's education, his formal education. But Tubman was a man who had the psychology down to a science. Tubman would divide families, take one member of a family and treat them very well. And the other member of that family, God bless him or her. And what he did also was to set up you see, you will find that from the advent of the Tubman administration, Liberian businesses went in a decline. So that we did not have men of economic strength and means in this country. You know, there were few people before then there was a Parker on the cement hill there. There was a James York. There was a William Dennis, you know, and a couple of other people that had businesses. But those businesses, for some reason or other, they folded. And you found no men of substance in this country to challenge Tubman. Okay? I'm not going to tell you the story of my own father. You can read it. Okay? Uh, who was Tubman's vice, vice president. <clears throat> okay? But everyone who tried to rise was emasculated. Was emasculated. And then what he did also, he developed this system called public relations officers. And it was a sort of quote unquote personal social welfare where he gave to whomsoever he wished this monthly check, be it how small it was, and to gain and retain the loyalty of that particular person. And it worked. It worked. You know, it worked until, you know, after his demise, then Torba cut it out and said, no, you have to work to get paid. You have to work to get paid. 
And then they say, oh, talk about me. Mean hearted, mean spirited. Because he says we have to work to get paid. And sir, that particular trend that was set up by Tubman has been one of the greatest deterrents to progress in this country. One of the greatest deterrents. Because the average Liberian man always wants something for nothing. He wants to see how he can get something in his pocket or in his stomach, you know, without working or paying for it. And that is one of the problems that confronts us today. One of the problems that we will have to find some way to resolve. Where the average man will get up and be willing to work a normal day for a normal wage. You know? I know first we've got problems that we got, I'm sure, about 85% unemployment in Liberia today. You know, every day I come, I walk the streets, I see this, I almost want to cry. You see, how so many people in the country are still suffering. And we continue to suffer, you know. Yesterday I was asking, I said, oh my God, why don't they reopen the logging business? You know, that if, for example, 50,000 Liberians are employed in logging, all right, then they, they extend the family. If it's five, then you get 250,000 people who will be able to gain from that. But we're still waiting for them to reopen the logging sector. And we have all these people here looking for jobs and there are no jobs for them. But I'm just hopeful that when the time comes and these jobs are available, that they will go and work at honest day work for honest day's dollar. Thank you. Well, I hope we even go beyond that because just work is not the key point. We must return ownership to our people. To have somebody else owning something and you just working as a laborer doesn't really solve your problem in the aftermath of all the suffering we've experienced. But uh, that's another question. Well, I'm, a ca I'm a capitalist. I'm not a socialist nor communist. Mm -hmm. I'm a capitalist. Yeah, well, one woman would die one. I understand your heart. Um, the thing is, so I'm feeling from what you just stated that there was a tension in the government with regards to how to deal with Tudman's policy. How to and deal with what, sir? Tudman's situation. Mm -hmm. You said no man could rise up. I know there was a case where one tried, but he was killed. And now we even heard hearings of how brutal his death was, and that even there's a potential that during Tudman's time, there was possible involvement in even what is called the slave issue of our own people, having the government having signed certain documents. We're going to investigate these details, of course. But what I'm getting at is that um, it would seem that there was a tension. And in 71, when he died, we've heard stories that the death was not just a natural type death. Do you have anything you would like to share on that? Well, you know, us Liberians, nobody ever dies a natural death. You know, there's always something else that you're attributed to. So I think that's one one of the same mm. in this case. Okay. You know, he had posture problems. He was operated on. It is claimed the operation was successful, but the doctors lost the patient. Okay, that's what it is said. Now, uh, more than that, he was in the London Clinic, one of the best medical facilities in the world. Okay, when he passed, you know. And you made a statement. I just like to clear a point. Maybe history may show history I haven't seen. But on Tubman's only association with the slave trade business was the fact that he was related to Alan Yancey and represented him at the trial. Okay? but that he himself had any association or affiliation with the slave trade. I've never heard that until today, coming from you, sir. Well, the facts will come out later as we carry out our investigation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, next one. Um, who really received the last 
financial treasury from the Chui party. You mentioned... Did I do what, sir? Huh? Did I do what? No, I said who received that last bulk funds from the Chui party? You mentioned about a situation involving people like uh, Jackson Doe and Ernest Eastman attesting and then one Jenkins Scott was finally given the authorization to get the money. So from your opinion, uh, the last trail of those funds should have been through the Minister of Justice at that time in government, meaning the well, government? May, maybe so, sir. I was in America. Mm -hmm. I couldn't come to Liberia. Okay. So I don't know what happened. I've come back here. I've heard different stories about example, what happened. What type of stories have you heard? To, to the money. Mm -hmm. But that's all he has evidence, sir. You know, I wouldn't want to bring so that here. Okay, let me put it another way. How much money do you think was involved in the account at that time? That was only 500,000 plus interest. 25, 30,000. 500,000 plus interest. Oh, 500,000 plus interest. Mm -hmm. Okay, but you had previously stated that you were willing to offer Mr. Chu Chu Horton a million dollars. I was offer, willing to offer who? Mr. Chu Chu Horton uh -huh. a million dollars. So you're saying I'll that... I offer his campaign, sir, not him. Was that a party funding or was that your personal funding? Oh, party funding. Okay. So you're saying that by that time, the true party treasury had been reduced to the point of only less than half a million dollars? No, sir. We are talking about funds that were overseas, not funds in Liberia. Okay. So how much were the local funds available and what happened to that? Two million dollars. Okay. And you have to happened? ask the you have to ask the functionaries of the Doe government that. Where what bank was it in? Put it that way that you all know about. Okay, some of it was in the Bank of Liberia, some was in Liberia Finance and Trust, and some was in Citibank. And you say most probably those bankers or the Doe government will have to account for the that? The Doe government, I am told, when they confiscated the funds. Ah. Now, what they, what they did with it, I never tried to trace the res. So you would say a ceiling of about three million would be okay or less than that? I wouldn't want to hazard a guess. But, but it was in the millions. It was in the millions. Um, next, this building, the Trui Party building, mm -hmm. um, who's the owner of that? Is it the actual Trui Party the owner of it, or is it in another name, or could you shed light on that? <coughs> well, legally, mm -hmm. that building belongs to the Trui Party. Okay. Now, what happened during the first days of the Doe government, with the decrees that were passed and this, that, and the other, confiscating properties? Now what have you? I don't know. Okay. And I never really went into it to try to ascertain, okay, uh, what, what they did at that time. Okay. But I've said often and on, and I would say in this open fashion, that it is my belief that that building should be turned over to the government of Liberia today. Because most of the proceeds that were utilized in the erection of the building came from Liberian taxpayers' money. And so therefore, the building should go to the Liberian government. It's a shame that governments after governments here have permitted that building to deteriorate to the state in which it currently is. They just sat down and watched the demolition of it and did nothing about it. I feel that the government should come in and take hold of it and redo the building and use it for government offices. Thank you. Also considering the fact that the party's activities during the period were foundational motivation for the whole revolutionary fight, we could say that that could have something to also do with reparation as a potential possibility. Also, do you have any other, the Chui Party have any other um, large structures or structures like that in other counties? Did you only have one main office or do you have offices in all of the counties of Liberia? We were just starting to erect offices. And the first office that we wanted erected was in uh, Grand Bassa, no, that the leadership was in Grand Bassa County. 
And I do know that the late, I think he's the late now, huh? Williams, Charles Williams, or is he still alive? Charles Williams came to me towards the end of their construction and borrowed for me personally $2,000. He had to finish the building, and then there was a prize of $10,000 to be given to the first one that finished that building. And so when he got the prize money back, he will pay me back my $2,000. I'm still waiting. But the building was finished. Uh, sir, oh, you I don't know. know. I left here in April of 1980 and never came back until February of 1991. Okay, so that means the Tui Party basically only had this one building in town, nothing in Maryland, for example, the headquarters of the president's Not that I know of. of anything? Okay. Next, I'm concerned about your opinion with regards to the root cause of Torbert's death. I know you've said things around, but nothing has been able to hit the nail on the head. You mentioned about the America situation that by the time he sort of turned down their desire to do some kind of uh, way station here, I don't know what it was, a military station or something? No, it was a uh, bunkering station. Bunker? Bunkering. Okay. Bunkering. bunkering is to bunk of fuel oil okay, for fuel. and jet oil for rapid transport of U.S. troops and equipment to the fight to the Middle East. Okay. So when he refused that, you said by then America really wanted him out. Yes, sir. And I think it was Carter who was the president of the country at that time, Jimmy Carter in America. Who? Jimmy Carter. I think he, he signed. The, he, I think he signed the document. You know, after after DMB and Fu, mm -hmm. okay, in the fifties, the American government, the, the Congress passed a law that no one could take out the president of a country mm -hmm. unless it goes before the Select Intelligence Committee, and they have the approval of it, and then the president signs it. In 1950, they passed that law. Yeah, in the in the mid 50s, mm -hmm. in the United States. So you think that maybe Carter had signed a document that would allow Torbert to have been taken out? I think 95 percent, yes, sir. So then, getting back to that case, we heard the situation of, for example, um, Doe, and we have heard testimonies on a sort of a left side military group that could have been behind the Wiswan and those others who actually carried out the coup. And we've also heard incidents of possibly funding coming from Lebanese, etc. But now with your side, I would wonder how could I link the American connection to that? Because there's I don't know how you confusion. could do it either. Mm -hmm. Because I don't think that is factual. So you don't think they factored in at that time? No. Even though they wanted it. Okay. There so, were a lot of people, so you know, like any time, you know, a lot of people wanted to talk about dead. Okay. When I spoke with him on that Wednesday, before the Friday, mm -hmm. I called him from Baton Rouge to let him know that I had done the deal for the rice. I had gotten the $25 million from the banks and all to come and do my rice project. Mm -hmm. He said, come back home as soon as you can. I said, how are things in Liberia? He said, they're not too good. Mm -hmm. So try and come back as soon as you can. And I said, okay. You know, I will. He said, come back here by the weekend. I said, yes, sir. But in truth, I plan going to Boston and seeing my sister and then taking a Monday plane to come to Liberia. Mm -hmm. yeah. And the event took place. So you wouldn't have any opinion or comment on that root cause factor leading to death besides what you've already said? Because we heard that there was possibility there was not just those particular fighters that did it. There was even a white person maybe involved in the process. I don't know what you have any... Well, you know, I was in America when it happened. I wasn't here. So you don't know anything about okay. it. Okay. But I hear there were Navy SEALs. Mm -hmm. Okay. Navy SEALs. Oh, you heard that also. That there were Navy SEALs. Mm -hmm. Now, the Flagamington issue, could you clarify that for me? You said that that one you knew was linked somehow to the American connection. And, but it's written in Bob Woodward. 
Woodward. That's Bob Woodward, who was the Washington Post for many years, he wrote a book mm -hmm. for Bill Casey, who was CIA director in the Reagan years. Do I have a copy of that book? No, sir. But I was shown it by someone. And I, and I read it with my own eyes. But I also, in about 1981, I read in a magazine that used to come as an insert in the Washington Washington Post or the Evening Star and they had in that a back they call the Saturday Review mm -hmm. and in the Saturday Review it mentioned the fact that they said Green Berets who were celebrating their some anniversary okay had had something to do with what happened on that fateful night in Monrovia here. Was that Green Beret? And what year was that again, please? The well, 1981. 81, 82. Washington Post? It was, it's an insert. Oh, it's okay. a magazine that's an insert, oh, an okay? Insert. Thank you. So it seems then that a lot of the information you gave us earlier, would you consider those first-hand or second-hand information with regards to the detailed process of um, Talbert's shifting away from right, from the American link uh, Tugman base idea to a right, I mean, a, a sort of a non-aligned position and those relationships he had where he was supposed to go to certain meetings in Cuba, et cetera. Would those be valid uh, first-hand information from the governmental sector or just things you heard second-hand? Sir, mm -hmm. for three years, I was Minister of Justice. Thank you, I just wanted to. Okay, you also mentioned about Kuampa. Kuampa, mm -hmm. who was the head of a coup mm -hmm. in a coup attempt rather in 1985 mm -hmm. and we have had several testimonies f about him in during this period but you clarified something that was very important that I had not heard before so I'm just concerned to verify that I heard it right did you say that could you just repeat yourself did you say that Kuampa was trained in Maryland around 19 Fort me uh -huh. Fort Meade in Laurel, Maryland, to be exact. What Maine? Meade, M-E-A-D-E. -E. <clears throat> okay. So that means he was given training by the American government. So, well, you draw your conclusions. <laughs> yeah, I assume that that place is not a place anybody can just go to for side training. Okay. And then he was allowed to come back to carry out that action. Thank you. He went to Sierra Leone first, then he came here through Sierra Leone. Also, you mentioned something about Prince Johnson receiving sub new supplies, uniform, etc. I didn't catch where he may have gotten those things from. But maybe they fell from the sky. Mm. Okay. But when he left Bong Mai, he left Bong Mai with them. Mm -hmm. Well, he split from Taylor, he didn't have them. Okay. So the ammunition, the, the uniforms, etc. From whence did he get them? Okay, I understand. Okay, next you mentioned about the rice issue. Well, no, you didn't directly mention that, but I would like to get involved in that a little bit. You did mention that you had a rice project, mm -hmm. which was a very viable and good project, mm -hmm. and in the capitalist system would have made you very rich. 
if it had gotten off the ground correctly. Hopefully so, yeah. Huh? Hopefully so, yes. yes. And in fact, we hope that it will happen now even as you are preparing to reactivate. Mm -hmm. That is your right. Um, but the government at that time now had also started a policy of increasing the price of rice. No, sir. Well, okay, these are things we, we heard that they were trying to do from the group that came to us with regard to the PAL, the Progressive Alliance of Liberian Group. Mm -hmm. They were giving us the opinion that because of this desire to increase the rice on the part of the government, they decided to stage these various uh, demonstrations, etc., to oppose this. So I just wanted to get your opinion. You know, I've never had a chance to get somebody who was in the system to tell us what they, how they saw this whole situation and that rice riot issue. I think, sir, like today, Liberia has one of the cheapest uh, rice marketing prices on this West Coast. I recall vividly when we had a meeting in Bentall that I mentioned to you, this whole question arose at that meeting. And what was said there was, is that Emmanuel Shaw? No. Oh, okay. Yeah, he was there at that meeting, so that's why I thought it was him. At that meeting, it was mentioned that there were such high increases in rights and the president says to the market women who are present I want three of you to be selected by yourselves and we will pay a way to go to all of the neighboring countries and find out what the price of rice is today and whether or not we in Liberia are selling rice at a price higher than they are in Guinea or Ivory Coast or what have you, or, uh, or Sierra Leone or what have you. Uh, there was in contemplation increase in the price of rice. That increase, to the best of my knowledge and recollection, never ever took place. It never took place. Okay? I repeat that there was propaganda coming from the PAL, propaganda coming from Moja, you know, there were certain things that whatever during that period they could see and pounce on to try to make the government look bad, they would. Because this was a new era in Liberia. It was one where you spoke your mind and nobody sent you to BTC the next morning for doing it. You know, I think it was in uh, February of 1980, I had gone to some affair they were having in Bentor, the AME church. And President Torba came there for a moment. Then there came the AME bishop who had just left Liberia and was then presiding somewhere else. And he said to me, he says, how are things in Liberia today? I said, well, we're trying. So he says, you know what this appears to me to be? I said, what? He said, if you take a bottle of champagne, a warm bottle of champagne and you start to shake it and shake it and shake it and then you open it it'll explode because it has been in that compressed fashion for so long a period of time that when you want to come and, and give it some relief by opening it up fast it explodes he said and that's what I see about to happen in this country. He says, where for so long there has been so much suppression in this country and all of a sudden you know there's change but he said maybe maybe this change is a bit fast and should be slowed down a little bit or else it will explode.
Thank you. So in essence, they sort of took advantage of an opportunity exactly. to focus on their goals and objective, but not exactly. necessarily it was a reality on the ground. Exactly. But um, you did mention that the government did see or was concerned about making that, looking into that area. And so I would like to know from their research and investigation, did they see any great any greater benefit for the Liberian people if the price could have gone up at that time and we could have focused on projects like yours where we'll become self-sufficient in rice and therefore turn that benefit over to the common people who were doing the farming activity? Did you see any parallel of that hopeful nature? <laughs> you know, <laughs> I think today one of the greatest proponents of that era he was then Rudolph Roberts, now he's Tobana Tipote. Okay? So I think of late, the President Selif appointed him as head of some commission to go and study pricing, etc., of rights and what have you. I'd like to know what his, what the results of his study. He's been doing that study now for over six months. Maybe he's reported, you know, but you know, the public would like to know what some of the results are, you know. Now, back in 1979, early 80, what happened then, or the results of the study, I don't know. As I sit here, I don't know. All I do know is that Liberia then, Liberia today, needs self-sufficiency in a staple food as a matter of national security, as a matter of, of economic sense, as a matter of financial sense. Because last year, we paid a hundred million dollars for importing rice into Liberia. That was when the price was between 470 and 500 dollars a metric ton. This year, the price went up to almost $800 per ton at one metric ton at one point. So you can see the appreciation in the cost and the drain on our meager financial resources, our foreign exchange, where there's a tremendous drain on it to pay for the staple food that we eat every day to bring into this country. So it is a must, it is a sine qua non to our development that we find some means of being self-sufficient in our staple. Thank you. My last question would just be a situation of just getting your opinion on something. I know you're not an economist, but Far you seem it. to be a, a businessman uh -huh. and you're a legal man also. Uh -huh. So when you look at Liberia's situation where the distribution of wealth in our country is so and balance where a few have access to the bulk of the wealth and the mass don't and considering how that in the past has been used by others in certain ways which we still need to follow up on what would you say about the potential of equitable wealth distribution in this country or from a capitalist point of view it shouldn't be tampered with and just the normal <coughs> capitalistic system should continue with welfare and other social security issues brought in to try to deal with that. I mean, you know, just considering the suffering we've gone through and Africa's poverty situation, would you like to share some small opinion on that area? You know, I will go to different areas before I come to a precise answer. <clears throat> Someone once asked, if they had one and a half billion dollars and went into China and gave each Chinese one dollar how much help would that be to the Chinese people in their economic development it's one side another side years ago I read a book novel called the man in a gray flannel suit. That man in the gray flannel suit woke up about 5.30 every morning, 
By seven he was at his desk. He worked until eight o'clock at night before he was able to leave sometimes later before he was able to leave to go home. His wife and daughter confronted him one evening. Especially the daughter said, Daddy, aren't you going to have any influence on my life and how I grow up? You leave all the time and go to work and you spend so little time here with me at home. The father said to his daughter, he says, you know, he says, what I do by working so hard is to create billions of dollars, but it gives jobs to people that go to work from nine to five. It pays for schools and hospitals. It pays for some of the jets that fly over to protect us and what have you. Now, what is more important, my dear, for me, who may have been specially endowed with certain talents? Is it better for me to spend much more time with you and desert those companies and corporations that I have that are benefiting all of the people? What's better? And you know, that's the question I put to you, sir. What's better? You know, to try and take care of a, you know, a multitudinous amount of people or to be selfish and devote that time to his one daughter that he had. I believe that the beauty of capitalism is that where there is a fair and even playing field that I spoke about when I first came here this morning even playing field where the children are all educated properly and given equal opportunities in the educational process okay that at the end of the day whomsoever is able to rise above the other let it be the government has certain mechanisms through taxation and what have you that are imposed upon people and we even have what they call a graduated income tax so that the more you make the more you are taxed if you make very little you are not taxed at all okay to my mind that system is better communism as such has proved a failure even in China today, it is not being used. Even Cuba, the last bastion, is trying to move away from it with, with the new uh, president that they have there. So, to my mind, the capitalistic way is the way to go. But you have government to protect the people. To protect the people by making certain that he that does not have but has only little is that wrong for the deprived of it but if you look take America for example you know you hear John D Rockefeller Rockefeller multi-millionaire first brother multi-billionaire how did he get his money initially he got his money in Ohio and other places there where he deprived other people of things that were theirs until in the end you know, he was during the industrial revolution in the 1870s 1880s but he had to go and have PRs to write books to clean up his image in the eyes of the American people take John Fitzgerald Kennedy he became president of the United States what about his father? He sold bootleg liquor in the 30s. And that's how the Kennedys got their money. Okay? But after a while, the two of them became senators and one president of the United States. That's the way of the world. That's the way of the world. You see today in America, you see Barack Obama to be put in office on the 20th of the next month. 
as the 44th, I guess, for whatever president of the United States. You know, but I saw that McCain was trying to debate him. I felt sorry for McCain. I really did. Because the education and, and qualifications that Obama has, you know, McCain, maybe at the Naval Academy, he was exposed a little bit to it, but didn't get it. But he can, he's no match to, to, to Obama in a debate. And Obama showed the American people that regardless of the color of my skin, I can cut it, I can do the job for you. So give me the job so I can do it. And they've done it. Education, sir, is the key to it all. Thank you very much. We only pray that the new government and future governments can recognize and understand the public mandate that is on them to make sure that that level playing field is put into place quickly and properly before that exploding champagne bottle continues to fizzle us again into another potential flame up. Thank you. And thank you for your contribution towards this process. Um, I have a few questions. And the first yeah. one is. I can't hear you. Um, I can't you said, hear you. I have a few questions. Surely. And the first one is you said you were a member of the True Party. My question is, when did you become a member of the Trui Party? Huh. Which year? You know, my father, before me, was a member of the Trui Party. My father, before me, was at one time General Secretary of the Trui Party, as I was later. And so, I would almost say to you, that I was born into the Trick Party. Um, the, the position you said you occupied when you enter was as I, I didn't get the, the title. I said that when I became a member of the cabinet, you know, before seven years before then. I was on a Supreme Court bench, so I had to be apolitical. When I became Attorney General, automatically each member of the President's Cabinet, according to the party rules and regulations at that time, automatically became a member of the Executive Committee of the party. Mm -hmm. And, and so I became a, a member of the Executive Committee. And your position was um, first vice what? No, none, at, none initially. I did not become second vice national chairman until I was out of the Ministry of Justice. Oh, vice national chairman. Okay, thank you. That's the name I wanted. Okay, um, the second one is uh, concerning the forms um, of the True Party. The what, madam? The, the forms mm -hmm. of the True Party that you said um, was in a U.S. Uh, account. No, I never said any funds were in a U.S. account. It's in the Caribbean. Oh, in the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that correction. Mm -hmm. um, my thought is that the True Party was a legally um, registered party. Mm -hmm. And that gives them the authority to source funding um, for their works or for whatever they were supposed to do. Am I correct? At that yeah, time, I didn't quite. I didn't get all of your statement. My question was: Was the True Party a legally registered party? Yes, it was. According to the Liberian Liberian laws. Yes, it was. And then it gives that that um, their being legally registered gave them the authority to source funding for their activities. To source funding. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Okay. And so um, the fund they had in the account. Mm -hmm. in the Caribbean was their money yes. that they sold um, for their activities. Yes. And so you were able to turn that over to the government of Liberia. My question is why? Because of the fact that the trade party had been dissolved by the government of Liberia. 
it no longer existed and that money I didn't feel should remain in limbo one secondly there were different people in and out of Liberia who were questioning my integrity by saying that I had taken that money or I was using the party's money for my own personal benefit and that is what angered me more than anything else when, when my integrity got into question so I said before they carry it any further let this money go go to the government of Liberia let it go says there's no more party let it go you said they were dissolved by the government of Liberia was mm -hmm. that also legal uh, not well under the, 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 the new constitution I said everything that the PRC did was legal they were not legal the government nobody should challenge it is that right sir we wanted to establish whether it was legal at that time. At what time? Whether it was the legal practice. Might makes right. Okay? That's the fundamental law. <laughs> Might makes right. And they were in power. They lined up a whole lot of people on the beach and killed them. Was that legal? You know? So now what about $500,000? Oh, we come to... Um, venture you were trying to get into before uh, you left the country. Mm -hmm. You said at that time um, you were doing some, uh, you were trying to get into this for the amount of 27 million? 25 million. 25 million. Mm -hmm. And my question is uh, was it all your personal money or was it that you had partners who were getting involved in it with you? The partners that I had were involved in getting the money for the feasibility study. Now, a country where its citizens eat rice three times a day, you don't need a Harvard, uh, you know, a business school to say that it is feasible for whatever rice you produce to sell it. Okay, so that. The monies were coming from a consortium of banks to finance the project. Did you have any individual involved in a um, partnership or only the banks you had involved? Yeah, Taylor Major was my partner in those days. Taylor Major, mm -hmm. okay. Taylor E. Major. And I took Oliver Bright with me when I went to America. He was also a partner? Uh, he would have been, he would have become Hi, about the president? Was he also a partner nah, at that time? Nah. No. Okay. No. No government official um, had anything to do with it. What year were you planning to um, start this business? Start so, uh, the, the rice, rice production? Yeah. 1980. 1980. Mm -hmm. um, was the increment in rice actually a thought by the government of Liberia or was it just something that was um, brought up? by the progressives. I told your colleague that to the best of my recollection, it was something that was discussed, but I do not recall, I know it was that increase, the price was that increase, okay? But the mechanics that were used in determining that the price should not be increased, I do not know, because I wasn't party to it. Uh, I only know the end result was that there was no increase in the price of rice at that time. But it was discussed. Hey, Madam, I've said that more than once. It was discussed, okay. and there was a committee set up to examine that. Okay. Headed, I guess, probably by the Minister of Agriculture, Minister of Commerce, and other people inside the government. So if, if that proposal had been, um, did you see the proposal that was brought up? Which proposal? about the increase in the price of rice because no. it was even mentioned here that there was a proposal no. for the increase you didn't see two it. years before then I started on my project madam two years before then okay thank you very much mm -hmm. thank you very much it's a witness for your testimony you have clarified certain point in connection to the funding to repair the heart up to the time the government was overthrown. 
but what you have now speaking to was that Doe was the last standard bearer of True Way Path. I saw something of that mentioned in this letter. Yeah. I thought it was too ludicrous to give any comment to. So the issue of Doe being the last standard bearer of True Path is not correct? I don't think so. I don't think so. I wasn't in Liberia now, that during that period. I left Liberia a few days before the coup d'etat took place, okay? And I never came back here until 1991, February. And so I wasn't here during that period. But I don't think that that eventuated. In your testimony, you made a recommendation that really touched me. You said the way forward for this country is people to come together where your grandchildren and my grandchildren will be able to sit together. But in order for us to reach this point, there should be equal opportunity, especially in terms of education, where everybody should be having the opportunity to be educated. Based on our visit in all the 15 counties, during our public hearing, we realize that this is still a challenge. It's still what? A challenge. Mm -hmm. Even though the government have sanctioned free primary education, but what we have gathered that some children today, after primary education, they drop out because there's no secondary education to where they live, so they end up being a tapper. Being what? A tapper. Mm -hmm. What do you think that Liberia need to do in order to provide all this, for example, if, if because there's no boarding school in that, you know, in, I mean, there's no secondary school in where they live, their locality, the parents can afford to send them to other county or the county capital to go to school because there's no lodging. So what do you think, what do you recommend? How can we bridge the gap? How can the the children of Liberia talk about the youthfulness of the society today. How can the children of Liberia be given the opportunity, especially in terms of education? I think that initially we have to build more primary schools. Then we have to build more uh, secondary schools in this country. But simultaneously with that, we have to start educating teachers to teach these students. Because, you know, in the early 60s, we were given a grant by the Dutch to build three teacher training institutes in this country. And the president had me and the late Lafayette Morgan to coordinate the project. I had difficulty at one time in dealing with the then Department of Education to get them on board of this project. So finally, when I got up was desperate, where the sector of education didn't want to meet with me and Morgan, I sent him a message. I said, I'm going straight to the president now, and I'm going to tell the president that you are not cooperating for us to get these institutions built. Within five minutes, I was in his office. After that, they're on Carey Street. That's where the education ministry was then. And we sat down and worked out this plan for three teacher training institutes, one in Webo, one in uh, Kakata, and the other in Lofa, okay? And those institutions were built. But for a long number of years, man, I, I was told that the one in Webo had cows and goats running through it, and not students, and not students. For a long time, we were helped out here by the U.S government starting with Kennedy by sending Peace Corps volunteers to Liberia. You know, 
And they came and they gave a lot of assistance to education at the primary and secondary levels in this country. And I think it helped educate a lot of our young people. But today we are in a different era. The era we are in today is one of high technology. So actually, you know, you don't need all of those teachers anymore because you can use screens and from one central point you probably can teach you know three four thousand children at the same time using one professor just having someone in the room like a proctor to make sure that the children you know demean themselves properly and pay attention to the screen so maybe we have to look at all sorts of innovative ways of trying to reach the masses with education. You might come and say, well, we got a problem with, with how will we generate power for those screens in the remote areas of the country. We have solar paneling. God gave us sun. We can use solar paneling as a means of, uh, of getting electricity, you know, to fire up that equipment. So all you have to do is to strive and work hard for these things. We can end up accomplishing them just have to work together to do it, you know. And I work with some schools in my area, there, you know, where I live. Uh, the last time I was able to get computers for eight of the schools, you know, small generators to go along with them. They were given by I, one of my clients did it, okay, give it. But uh, we need to continue things like these and people when they have opportunity to get they should think of these young children and not think of themselves not look for personal aggrandizement but instead to see how if we are able to get certain funds we can use them for the betterment of our youth to get them educated that's what we need to do that's what most of us are not doing because everybody thinks first of how they can get money fast, they can get rich fast, or what have you, and they forget the poor children. The poor children. Some of them pass those children on the way up, but they've left them down there without thinking about them anymore. Thank you very much. I want to thank you. Mr. Westmith for uh, testimony. For us, we have no question because uh, our colleagues have made all the questions. Thank you for coming. Thank you. We also want to thank you very much, honorable witness. I have just few questions. The first one relates to one of the sessions you reacted to in your opening statement where a witness came before this commission and said that uh, you as a prosecutor at the time uh, encouraged him to perjure himself in a case. I want to ask, do you remember the particular case in question? I wasn't here. And I heard someone mention that someone came before this commission and said that I offered them two thousand dollars for them to perjure themselves, you know, before a judge and jury. And I know that that never ever happened. So I was wondering who it was, so I could go ask him why he came here and lied on me. It was a case. It was a case in which some military officers were charged with treason, mm -hmm. and uh, I'm not too certain, but I think it was Chulu. Who? Oh. Uh, I can't remember the witness, but it was a case where military officers were charged with treason. And according to the witness on the stand, 
uh, after he took the stand and exposed um, the conspiracy to have him perjure himself, the case was dismissed. And then uh, he was redeployed or reassigned to another position in government as much as the accused were. You don't recall? That is not factual, sir. Okay. There's only one case involving treason that I prosecuted in my capacity as Minister of Justice. There were three defendants, and they were all convicted. Okay? Pardon them. Suddenly. The president pardoned them subsequently. And, you know, in certain respects, Willie Tauber was a softie. He, when he pardoned them, he pardoned them, he was in Grand Jetta to a 26th celebration and he sent word to me because I was ill, I didn't go and he sent word to me to have uh, Prince Brown and Sadie released earlier the Minister of Defense had gone to the President and they had called me in and they said the third defendant a gentleman by the name of uh, Pade. Pade had acute hypertension and they were afraid that if we kept him in prison he might die. Then they would come and say that we tortured him or something like that. So the president said that being the case release him. So I released Pade before Sadie and Brown were released. Whatever happened to Sadie, I don't know. But the very same president came to me, uh, sent for me and told me, he said, go and find a job for Prince Brown, who had thereto been assistant minister of defense for Coast Guard. He told me, he said, go find him a job. I went to Lamco and because I was a member of the board as Minister of Justice and I asked them to please find a job for Prince Brown and they found him a job and he worked there until the 1982 now what happened after that I don't know but he was there until the 1982 working with Lamco so now where, who, where, where did witness get his the witness was Charles Judy where he lied he lied to this commission. And the facts, the, 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 the facts is bear that out. These men were convicted, they were incarcerated, okay? The Supreme Court had held, upheld the lower court's judgment. There was one dissenting justice, Justice Horace, okay? But the court affirmed and confirmed the lower court's uh, judgment on the matter, and they were incarcerated in accordance with for the judgment. Okay, thank you. Um, <clears throat> April 14, 1979, mm -hmm. there was a rest riot and there was shooting and allegations are around that people died. That what? People died mm -hmm. at the time. To date, we do not have it under, fully understood how the others evolve for the army or the police to open fire on what should have been a peaceful demonstration. Was that a situation that confronted the establishment at the time? Well, I remember the occasion. I remember it very well. Although I was no longer in government. From what I am told, These gentlemen, headed by Bacchus Matthews and a few others, decided to stage a march. And this march was being staged, presumably, uh, to raise contention about the high cost of rice. Okay? 
when, as I said earlier, the price of right had not been increased. They went and were refused permit to march by the Ministry of Justice. But they still decided that they would march. On the Thursday before it, I was on the tennis court with Oliver Bright, who was then Minister of Justice, Francis Cape, who is around the Minister of Finance at one time, deputy another time here, and a guy called Bill Platt. And I put it to Oliver. I said, are you all ready to respond to this demonstration on Saturday? And he said, oh yes. He said, from 4 o'clock in the morning, we have troops, you know, with fixed bayonets and uh, in fatigues on the streets of Morovia to keep it quiet. And so I asked him, I said, well, what about the stun guns? the die and other things that I had ordered when I was minister were you used for riot control he said well they, they, they never arrived in Liberia okay he didn't meet them when he got there and he succeeded Lawrence Morgan they were not there so on that day I was out of town but I came into town early in the day and I was on Camp Johnson, not Camp Johnson, the BTC Road, went to look for some plumbing fixtures. And everyone said, the crowd is coming. It's a crowd of unruly people. That some of the guys, you look in their eyes, you can see that they have been taking drugs. So, you be careful. I got right back in my car and I headed out of town. I went back to Konala and I spent the rest of the day there. People would come up and get reports about people being killed in town. Okay? But uh, I stayed out until about 11, 30, 12 that night. I came back in town and went home to bed. By the next morning I heard about all the devastation and destruction that had taken place in town. And that Monday morning, I got dressed and I went to the mansion. And what struck me was that when I got on the fourth floor, the door to the president's office was open. You know? And everybody was just moving in and out in a helter-skelter fashion. So, I was concerned, but I also heard that some police had shot and killed some soldiers, two lieutenants, and their bodies were lying at BTC. So right then I saw the chief of staff, Cowboy Johnson, and I called him to the side and I asked him, I said, is this true? He said, no. He said, well, let me call back and confirm. He called, he came back and said, no, it's not true. So I said, well, then you go over to Information Next Door and broadcast it to the nation that it is not true. Otherwise, then I soon we'll have fight between the police and the soldiers. Yeah. And he went across and did that. Okay. But the destruction was horrendous to this city on that occasion. And uh, that was the beginning, I think, of the end for us. I try to draw a correlation between your decision to surrender the 500,000 And the recommendation you've just made that the TWP should be utilized by government since it was built out of taxpayers' 
money. And then I want to extend it further, and I want you to tell me whether my extension is fair enough. Government has used, over the years, properties belonging to individuals, some or many of whom were former government officials or relatives of past government officials and all of that. And this has happened for a long period. Is there any sense of equity that would justify government maybe um, justly compensating those people now and transforming those buildings into state properties after 40, 50 years of uh, rental? You say, uh, I didn't catch the last part, you said, did it make any sense? Yeah, that government will now nationalize those properties compensate the owners properly and then they become uh, uh, public buildings. Ministry of Education, for example, Ministry of Defense, forever they've been government property. I mean, used as government public offices, but they actually are not government-owned properties. Well, you know, my personal thoughts on this whole issue of government offices is that we should have a complex Right next year, we have the TWP building. Across the street, they have a bank building that is unfinished. I would suggest that those two buildings be completed by government and utilized for offices. That the lot adjacent to the bank building, a storage parking facility be put there for the government employees when they drive to work to park their cars there. And as you go further down Ashman Street, the same will obtain where the Central Bank building is. That should also be completed and utilized, you know, for government offices. And next door, the Centennial Pavilion is in such a terrible state of disrepair that that be demolished and a story a uh, building be put there for government offices. I think that, together with the completion of the Ministry of Defense, the completion of the Ministry of Health on the road to Painesville, will be sufficient to handle the ministries of government. And if someone had to go to two or three ministries, well, there's a company on Ashman Street and do most of their business except as foreign affairs, defense, or health. Thank you very much. That's but, I, I, yeah, but I wouldn't, as you know, you're a lawyer. The taking of private property has to be for a public purpose. Okay? And as long as that, that public purpose continues, then the property can be taken, provided as just compensation, of course, for that. But take where the justice ministry is. That property belongs to the Tubman family. Okay? And it has, for time immemorial, belonged to that family. We used to have the Department of Public Instructions, as it's called in those days, in that place in the 40s. Okay? But I think that the Justice Ministry, because it has so many components, could be put in one building and be done with it. Maybe they can negotiate with the owner of the property adjacent. It's also top mother. I don't know which of the top ones, though. I do know that Sher Tubman Jr. owns the Justice Ministry. But who owns the building adjacent to that? Another Tubman, I don't know. If you can do that and link the two, and then you can bring in immigration, you can bring in NSA, you can bring in fire service, you can bring all those people and put them in one building. And it will give the minister better control also. Because some of these people think that that they are ministers of, them, of themselves, you know, and not a part of justice. 
That's Thank my two cents worth on that. Thank you very much, Councillor Clarence L. Simpson, Jr. On behalf of the Commission, we want to say your testimony has just ended. I want to thank you very much for taking up your time to share your thoughts with the Commission. We take note of the several recommendations and without doubt we are certain you have added some value to our work. Is there a last word you'd like to leave with the Commission or people of Liberia before you leave? Well, I will end as I started. Okay. The Liberian is a good human being. The Liberian is a very friendly human being. The Liberian, I think, if he can get out of confrontation, other than playing sports or what have you, he would try to avoid confrontation. I think that the average Liberian is a very quiescent person who quietly goes about his or her business. And they have wrongfully been exploited, have wrongfully been exploited by a few for their own personal gain. And this we should try to see that a stop is put to it. And as I said initially, we need to all put arms together and see how we can bring this country out of the devastation that it's in. But the key to that is the education and we have to stop the corruption. We have to stop the corruption. And it should be such that whomsoever we find putting their hands in the government's till to take a nickel out or a million dollars out should be prosecuted and jailed. And jailed for that. Because what they are doing is that they are depriving the young children of money for their health, money for their education, money to build roads and bridges and other facilities of our infrastructure that we need for our development. We have to do something about that. It is of major importance that we start successfully prosecuting these people who keep on stealing government money. Thank you. Thank you very much.